Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, God with us. Sukkot 2022 begins at sunset today, Sunday, October 9th, 2022, and will end next week, Sunday, October 16th, 2022, at sunset. The Jewish feast of Sukkot represents the millennial reign of Christ. It's the time when the Lord God himself will come and tabernacle with us and reign from the new Jerusalem. Let us turn to our scriptures, please, to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall... shall she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Normally, we associate this scripture with Christmas, but today we'll associate it with Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, because Jesus our Lord and Savior, our God has promised that he will tabernacle with us. The word tabernacle means residence or dwelling place. It also means to dwell. God has promised to dwell with us. God with us. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. What a great and mighty promise we have from our God. For what is man that God himself should tabernacle or dwell with us? We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us right now. But one day, Jesus comes back. When he comes back, he himself will physically dwell with mankind. We will be able to see him. We'll be able to walk with him. We'll be able to talk with him. We will, he will be our God and we will be his people. But Matthew wrote this portion of scripture he was quoting a prophecy from the prophet Isaiah concerning the coming of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This all came about because of Ahaz's idolatry and rebellion against God. Israel had joined forces with Syria and was threatening Judah. Ahaz, the king of Judah, was very frightened. He was afraid. But God looked down and had mercy on Judah because of David, his servant, because of David's sake. This is the message that he sent Ahaz through Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 4. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Razan and Syria and the son of Ramaliah. After giving King Ahaz that promise, the promise of deliverance, Isaiah then told him, told Ahaz, to ask the Lord for a sign. And he could make it as great as he wanted. But Ahaz refused. Here's the account of what happened. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10 through 12. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. 
Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Isaiah was a bit perturbed at his answer. And he told, I, uh, told, told Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It was because of Ahaz's rebellion and blatant disbelief why he would not ask for a sign. The Lord told him, ask for anything, any sign, make it big as you want to. I will give you the sign, I will grant it. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. He was putting his hope and his trust in idols and not the living God. And that's why he refused to, com to, to, to commit himself to God by asking for a sign. Because of of this, if he had asked for a sign, then he would have to be obligated to trust God when God made that sign come true. So God responded by saying that he himself would give a sign by sending a deliverer to not only deliver and save Israel, but to deliver and save everyone else who will believe, whomsoever will. Jesus came to be the way for everyone, for every nation, for every tribe, and for every tongue. No one is left out. No one is excluded. No one is disqualified from the plan of salvation. Whomsoever will can come and receive through faith the free gift of salvation. That prophecy came to pass over 700 years after it was made, but it came to pass. It came to pass in the God-man, Jesus Christ. For when the fullness of time, God sent his only son, Jesus, that he might save us, might deliver us from our sins. The promise of Revelation 21 was given to us over 2,000 years ago. And not one of God's good promises have ever failed. And this one will not fail either. So prepare yourself and prepare your house. Jesus is coming back. Make no mistake. He will come back to get us. That where he is, there we shall be also. And there we will be with him forever and forever and ever and ever. Amen. Even though we have this great and wonderful promise. Many refuse to believe. They refuse by living like Jesus will not come back. Like Jesus has no plans of coming back at all. It is not words so much as the actions or the lack of actions on people's part. They live like there is no God. Or they live like he will never come back. Jesus compared two types of last day servants, the faithful servant and the wicked servant. Check it out. Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 through 51. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If this is the case, this should spur every Christian and especially the pastors to do what they're called to do and stop 
buying into the political agenda to compromise the gospel and divide the races. Is God divided? Is Jesus a Democrat? Is Jesus a Republican? Is the Holy Spirit given for only one race? No. He's given to every one, whomsoever will. So you had better turn off the programming and open up your Bibles and begin to read and begin to study and to begin to, 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 to uh, devote yourself to the things of God. I'm just about tired of hearing Christians with huge platforms weighing in on and promoting the hate agenda and the division of the races. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If you want to be called a son of God, you had better adhere to the prerequisites and be peacemakers and not dividers. I don't care how big your ministry is or how much talent you may have. It does not matter how well known your name may be. You are not above the law of God. God is no respecter of persons, meaning there is but one law for everyone, one law for all, and not one law for you and one law for everyone else. You are to be peacemakers if you want to be called sons of God. You had better concentrate on what is before you and forget what is behind you. I read a story about a golfer who said to his golfing partner, I'd move, I'll move heaven and earth to break a hundred. His exasperated partner replied, you better concentrate on heaven. You dug up enough earth for one day. And so it should be with us. We should have enough of this old world. We should be tired of this old world and the things of this old world. We should feel dirty from what's going on in this old world. And we should begin to concentrate on eternity. Eternity is a long, long time and many, many people are not preparing for it. They are making plans for everything else. They're making plans for the here and now. They're making plans to do this, making plans to do that. But eternity is way, way down on their agenda. Matter of fact, it's not even a part. It hasn't even made it to their to-do list. People, especially Christians, need to get prepared for Sakat, God with us. Because when he comes back, it will be too late to make changes. It will be too late to begin preparing them. I've seen Christians go on vacation laying back and soaking up the sun. And nothing is wrong with that in itself. But when you begin to add smoking and drinking and alcoholic beverages in the mix, that is a problem. That, my friends, is not a Christian act. Just to put it bluntly, that is an act of rebellion, if anything. We are to keep ourselves separate we are to keep ourselves holy. We are to walk righteously before our God. Christians need to stop catering to the flesh and begin catering to their spirit. Because one day, eternity will start. And only those who have oil will be able to trim their lamps and enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. This present state, this present body that we live in now, it's, it's, it's not going to last. It's only a temporary shelter for us. Paul wrote to the Corinthians church, reminding them that we have a house not made with hands, and it is designed to last for all eternity. This house is not a brick and mortar house, but a spiritual body, an eternal body, an immortal body. It will last throughout all eternity. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 says, For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be farther clothed, that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Too many Christians are walking around offended instead of groaning, being burdened with the sins and iniquities of this generation. This world is not our home. This world is not for us. We don't have to 
fight for and defend this world. This is not our home. Let those who are part of it, those who consider this world their home, let them uphold it. Let them protect it. Because all this, all this you see here is a little passing away. It will soon be gone. It will be swallowed up in eternity. But for us, this is a temporary state. This is not our home. We're only passing through. Our home is an eternal one. One that God himself will dwell with us in. Jesus will sit on his throne and he will tabernacle with us and we with him. Let us look at verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 it says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. We are not unprepared, but we are prepared having been given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. And anything that the Lord God guarantees will certainly come to pass. For if God is the builder, who can destroy? If God is the preparer, who can disrupt? For who can turn back God's hand when he stretches it out? Or who can say to him, what are you doing? So if God himself has prepared for us this very thing, what more do we have to fear? What more do we have to fight for? Do not soil yourselves again with the things of this world after God has prepared you for eternity. Look at this frightening verse found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We must appear. It is not according to who you are or what you have done. It is not according to the high position you held in this life. It's not according to who you think that you are. It's not even according to if you believe or if you don't believe. It is this, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There we will all be judged according to what we have done, according to what is written in the books. If we have, have hidden secrets like hate in our hearts or unforgiveness, and believe me, it will show that the Lord, who is the judge of all the earth, he will know, for he will see it, for nothing is hidden from him. The bottom line is this. Be prepared in season and out of season, so that when the Son of Man, that is Jesus, returns, he will find you doing what it is he called you to do, and then you will receive your great reward. This is only a small snippet of what we have to look forward to. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. There will be no more tears, no more death, no more sighing, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, no more when people take advantage of us. For the Lord himself will be with us and he will be our God and he will be our protector. Why will there be no more of those bad things? Because all the former things have passed away and Jesus has made all things new. So why would we compromise such a great and glorious uh, promise by throwing our lot in with, with this wicked and evil generation? What am I talking about? I'm talking about God with us. I'm talking about forsaking this world and the things of this world and clinging to the Lord God. Clinging to Jesus our Savior, the Redeemer of our souls. The return of Christ is near upon us. 
we had better begin to take God seriously, get rid of the miserableness, and pursue the righteousness of God. We, as I see it, are running out of time. The time of Jesus' return is nigh upon us. You know, the story is told about John Wesley. One day, John Wesley came down for breakfast in a melancholy mood. He was miserable. Since in the situation, Mrs. Wesley went upstairs, dressed in black, and came down to join him. Who's dead? Wesley asked. God, she replied. Oh, no, he said. Wesley responded, Mrs. Rat Wesley responded, I thought so from your countenance and your conduct. Let me just tell you, God is not dead, but very, very much alive. And he is coming back for us one day. And from the signs of the time, that day is very, very soon. So we had better get rid of the melancholy moods. We had better wipe the miserableness from our face and put on a smile and be prepared to meet our maker. Be prepared to meet our judge. For soon we will see his face, the face of almighty God. So let me ask you, do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Do you know him? Are you ready for his return? Are you ready to meet him? If you're not, let me ask you, would you? Would you like to be prepared? Would you like to know him as your own personal Savior so that you can be prepared to meet Jesus? If you would, here's how. All you got to do is to ask. Ask Jesus into your heart. Say this prayer with me. Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, Lord. Help me to live for you. Help me to forget the things of this world and look forward to the day that you return. Help me to be ready for your return. But not just me alone, but my household, my friends, my co-workers. Help me to be a witness, Lord Jesus, of your goodness. Help me to be a witness of your resurrection. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I would like for you to do is to buy yourself a Bible. Begin to read your Bible. Read it every single day. Get that highlighter. Highlight the verses. Highlight those promises that are meaningful to you. Memorize them. Commit them to, to, to memory. And then find yourself a Bible-believing church. Not one of those progressive churches, but a Bible-believing church who believes in a right way and a wrong way. And who preaches the, the, the righteousness of Almighty God. Join that church. Be disciple in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.